In the early days of the internet, radical libertarians were scattered, lonely, and faceless. Without direction, they resigned to scour the web, sifting through content providers in a wasteland plagued by YouTube demonetization, Facebook jail, and covert internet censorship. But then, in 2017, the Libertarian Union was formed. Finally, the average Joe Libertarian could find a thriving community of independent podcasters and content providers, all in one convenient location. At Libertarian Union, we'll always have the latest news, interviews, discussions, and even movie reviews. With hundreds of episodes and more added all the time, you'll always find something fresh at libertarianunion.com. of Libertarian Union listeners uh, to this uh, State of the Union episode. How's everybody doing? I'm Trey with uh, Subversion Webcast. Uh, we are joined today by uh, Tony Rockmora of Don't Waste Your Hate, We've got Patrick McFarlane of Liberty Weekly, uh, Kyle Anslone of Foreign Policy Focus, and of course uh, Daniel with uh, actual Anarchy and Last Nighters, as well as his co-host, Robert, I believe. Is Robert with us? I'm here. Hey, what's up, buddy? Hey, what's going down? <laughs> Too much? All right, so I guess we uh, we kind of just talk current events, spitball about whatever's going on. Um, and there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of stuff that us libertarians aren't too uh, happy about. Uh, uh, the conversation on guns right now has reduced to something of a uh, caricature and I think it looks a lot like Idiocracy. Have you guys ever watched that movie? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got to listen to that actual Anarchy episode. I've got it on my queue. It's on my backlog of stuff to listen to when I get some time. So I listened to it, but I actually haven't seen the movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real good one, actually. It's a good yeah. film. So, um, I don't know. I was just talking to a guy today, um, a, lib a self-avowed libertarian who is uh, saying that he likes John Bolton. So my day <laughs> started off. My day started off kind of. Yeah, that was like the first thing I saw on social media, and I just like put it down. And until now, I've just been playing video games just because that bothered me so much. <laughs> Are you serious that I was a libertarian? Because I just said on my yep. show today that no libertarian has ever liked John Bolton. Well, <laughs> so there's... It's going to blow up on me before I even publish the episode. Yeah, <laughs> well, I wouldn't count outliers as uh, defining the rule. This guy, he's obviously just a conservative. I mean, if you like John Bolton, you can't be a libertarian. It's just a contradiction. It's like saying that, I don't know. You're a vegetarian, but you eat veal or something. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this well, is like the, the most cruel form of meat that you can possibly eat. Don't tell me you're a vegetarian. <laughs> the problem uh, is uh, you got Larry Elder, Ben Shapiro, and Stephen Crowder. They call themselves libertarians sometimes. So <laughs> it depends what you think of a libertarian, right? Oh, yeah, and you'll get your head bitten off by saying, uh, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> And they're, they're like, oh, you can't pull the purity test on everything, you know. Anyway. Pretty um, important part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> if we uh, believe in property rights and the proper threshold of violence in society, then I think John Bolt's about the least representative of libertarian, libertarian ideas. So, um, yeah. I don't know. A lot of frustrating conversations for me out there. Uh, so... I don't know. What about uh, what about some of you guys? Uh, what are you arguing about with people online these days, Patrick? Yeah, I'll take it first. I had a bunch of alt right guys commenting. I I kind of vented about this in the Facebook group, but there were two two alt right guys that were commenting or alt light on my video, that YouTube video that we did with Tony about libertarians in the culture war. And I don't know if you guys checked out the comment thread. I wouldn't suggest it, but I challenged them to a debate, and they called me a faggot and said no. <laughs> on the show, a debate on the show. Because you can't get down to truth when you're you know, just commenting offhandedly from a cell phone or something. And it, it was you know, the common border stuff. But there seems to be a disconnect in 
the knowledge and like Ron Paul really talked about this in some of his YouTube videos, but there's a real disconnect between the realization that our government's policy caused the migrant crisis. And I don't know if, you know, alt-right people don't realize that because I say alt-right and alt-light interchangeably, but they're not the same thing, obviously. But, I mean, then they say that, oh, I'm arguing because because I argued that, I'm arguing that we deserve it, that that Americans should be resigned to their fate with these refugees. I, I'm just saying we should stop it. <laughs> well, they entirely don't believe that um, the migrant crisis has much of anything to do with foreign policy. They think that uh, Islam is, uh, you know, sort of destined to do that by its ideology. They say that even if we didn't have uh, Libya being overthrown, we'd still have a migrant crisis, which is historically and geopolitically, uh, you know, illiterate of them to say because uh, Gaddafi, I mean, he was a bad dude, but he was the bulwark against uh, African migrants going into Europe. And it is undoubtable there were thousands of people a day during the peak of this migrant crisis that were flooding through the Mediterranean Sea. I mean, this is not something that's up for debate. That These are facts, and it's just simply inconvenient for these people. Um, and I mean... I have my problems with Islam. I mean, I'm an atheist, for God's sakes. It's the worst, most oppressive form of religion in the world, but still That was almost time, a very ironic statement. <laughs> what's that? I'm an atheist, for God's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, and uh, it's just the culture I've grown up in, right? Anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, like, they, they, like, have this pattern, or, I mean, this culture of marrying their first cousins and things like that, and... That makes them more prone to aggression, people who are born of incest and things like that. So, I mean, yeah, that's a problem, but um, at the same time, I, I think it's kind of disingenuous just to say that the only reason why um, we're having problems with Arab and Muslim migrants is just because of that's what Islam is, and it has nothing to do with foreign policy. I think that's really, I don't know, really naive. So anyway, Kyle, I guess that's a kind of uh, good segue to get you in here. <laughs> so um, what, uh, what sort of things would you recommend reading for uh, to sort of get good arguments against that kind of BS? <laughs> well, I mean, man, yeah, Tony's holding up uh, Fool's Aaron by Scott Horn, which is an absolute recommendation. I mean, if you're talking about the Libya situation and the migrant crisis, then you know, the, the two things that were kind of going, around, uh, going on in 2011 was first the overthrow of Gaddafi and then was the arming of the uh, Syrian insurgency, or not insurgency, I guess, but yeah, the Syrian Sunni rebellion. And uh, which turned into like you know Al Qaeda and ISIS and all that, and so yeah, you have millions of people flooding out of Libya, flooding into Libya, and then through Libya and out of Libya, and uh, you have the same situation in Syria. And so it's absolutely a, the U.S. foreign policy and the foreign policy of NATO uh, that leads to these situations where you have you know a massive amount of people looking for new homes. I'm sure that. You know, people in the Middle East just don't sit there and stew all day about how much they hate America. I mean, that's a completely ridiculous thing to – nobody does that, right? Like, everybody thinks about, like, the things that are going on around them and in their own lives. It, you know, these people are struggling to survive. They're, you know, looking for their next meal. They're, you know, worried about what's going on locally, making sure everything kind of stays in an order that they're able to survive. And then when the U.S. comes and drops bombs – and that, you know, blows up maybe a road and now or a bridge and suddenly you can't get to the market anymore. So how do you sell, you know, your food or how do you buy more food and, and all this stuff? And that's the only time a lot of these people end up even start thinking about the U.S. in the first place. So, you know, the first place to look is American foreign policy. Uh, as far as reading goes, definitely fool's errand. Uh, you know, listen to the Scott Horn Show. Uh, it's great. LibertarianInstitute.org, Antiwar.com. All, all major suggestions for that. Well, yeah, I, I, sorry, I just wanted to, to yeah. dip in there. I'm, I'm borrowing your term, Patrick. Um, we actually had Kyle on our show talking about the Brad Pitt movie War Machine, and we get into some of the um, 
the tactics that were being employed on the ground there and that these people were, were being um, bombed and, and, and very upset and, and that results in blowback. And so that's episode 53, if anyone wants to catch that with Kyle uh, on our show. So actually, anarchy.com slash 53. Uh, back to you, Patrick. Oh, I was just going to say that I was making these parallels between like the war on terror, you know, uh, be afraid of terrorism, give us, you know, all these extra Fourth Amendment bypasses in the Patriot Act. And I think the the closed borders, you know, border centric solution is very analogous to that situation where, you know, give us all this more power. We'll stop migrants coming in, except we won't. <laughs> and um, we're just going to eviscerate the Fourth Amendment instead. You know, you you have the the blowback, the you know, the the effects of a given policy and you want to fight the effects instead of the cause of the policy. I don't know. We've, we've been over this quite a few times, so it's kind of rehashing old points, but. I like to always say, I like to always say, you know, would you, do you think that East uh, Germany should have eliminated the welfare state before they smashed down the Berlin Wall? You know what I mean? Like, because that's what that's what the bordertarian argument seems to come down to is that we can't allow people in, you know, um, because we have a huge welfare state. I, I, you know, that's maybe kind of a bad comparison, East Germany to America, because they were suffering economically for decades and things like that, whereas uh, America is sort of this like global hegemon. But, you know, well, they they think that people are going to come in and vote for bigger government. And my, my answer to that is, well, look all around you. Everyone, you're going to deport all the Republicans and the Democrats because they both vote for bigger government on a massive and, scale. And maybe let's put restrictions on people being able to breed because people who are born in America vote for big government. So, I mean, how logically far are you going to take that conclusion that we shouldn't let people into the country who vote for big government? We should also apply that domestically, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what about the college campuses? You know, shut them down, burn them down, because I'm, you know, I'm being uh, hyperbolic a little bit here, but, yeah. What were you going to say, Daniel? I was going to just say that I think that Trey's um, analogy of East Germany is actually apt. It's just that the, the wall would be used in the opposite direction initially, but it can very easily have converted to the, to the opposite, you know. So, like, it may be intended to keep people out, but it's not very difficult to change that direction and say, okay, now you got to stay in. Put people in FEMA camps and stuff. <laughs> well, in, well, I, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think, too, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, everybody's like, oh, well, you know, the immigrants are never going to see things our way, and they're always going to vote for bigger government. Well, at the same time, like, if you always have a policy that's against them to begin with, then, yeah, that is going to be the thing. But I, I don't see any reason why the Republican Party or the Libertarian Party shouldn't focus part of their campaign on identifying regulations and different laws that explicitly hurt minority com communities, you know, drug laws. I, I just saw some poor woman has been fined over $100,000 for braiding hair because she refused to get, you know, get licenses and certifications <laughs> and all that stuff. And so, and the other thing is, it never made sense to me that somebody says, well, I'm afraid of big government, so I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> I mean, how is that a solution to your problem whatsoever? Right. Yeah. Just well, staying on the, go ahead, Patrick. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll throw it to you after this. But, um, the, but I do have a concern for uh, incompatible cultures, you know, and, and I, I think it's ridiculous that they would straw man me in that sense and say that, you know, I think... You know, we should deport all these people and, you know, because I, I do have a concern for that. I think um, it is kind of a problem. I don't think there's a government solution to it. But, you know, let's just get back to regular market levels of immigration, people coming because there's jobs that need to be filled and, uh, you know, getting rid of all the government, of, you know, affecting the market. So, sorry. What? Go ahead, Trey. No, I think that's a really good point. And, I mean... You know, even to appease the kind of alt-right, alt-right sort of people, I would even say that a full, like, free market on labor and immigration would actually have a reduction in people coming, mass immigrating from the third world. And you'd only really get people who have saved up enough capital in their destitute to get to a good place in the world. 
Um, and I think it's really worth noting, you know, people, and you could be talking to people from the left, and I think you could um, bring up the example of like Sweden as a great, a great example of a bad way that you could do uh, have an immigration policy if we're talking in the realm of the, the paradigm of public policy. Uh, Sweden just like brought in a bunch of uh, immigrants and just basically ghettoized them by putting them on the government dole and then generations later they don't know the language, they haven't been forced to even feign uh, learning anything of, of the, uh, the culture or uh, the language in order to be productive there. And, you know, for all the faults, uh, you know, Patrick and I live in Minnesota and, you know, we, we're not worried about um, Arab um, and African, like, terrorist attacks. I mean, we have a lot of, of Somali and even, and even Laotian and um, um, Hmong immigrants here who have been victims of American foreign policy. And we still, you know, we still haven't seen cars getting blown up and things like that. And I think that has largely to do with the fact that for all of the faults of the welfare that we do give them, we at least like push them in, into like being self-sufficient and being involved in the market. Whereas somewhere like Sweden, they literally just, you know, they thought the best thing to do for them was just to put them on the dole. And obviously that's not the right thing to do because, you know, people, people need something to do. People need purpose. And, if you just put people in a plot of land and isolate them, you know, that's, you're asking for a lot of problems down the line. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think Patrick's right that I think it's wrong for both the alt-right alt -right folks to malign us as libertines or, you know, people who just believe that all cultures are the same or something like that because, uh, you know, I, I, personally don't want our our country or anything to get flooded with um, with a bunch of third world people and uh, the only way I see that happening is with government actually trying to you know mass immigrate people so anyway uh, <clears throat> so it's sorry did you oh go ahead sorry yeah no I agree with you um, I actually Jeff and I on the last episode of our show don't waste your hate dot com slash thirty five we did get into this a little bit where we kind of had a little thought experiment on you know what would a private property society actually um, be like in terms of immigration and we did touch on what you said it's probably that only people with uh, you know money to invest or to buy property or if they had job contracts. Um, would really want to come in because there would be nothing for them otherwise. So it is a, it, the free market would be the proper solution. Um, but if I could also go back to the original point, which was um, about uh, the culture of Islam being kind of the, you know, that they, they will attack us no matter what. I think that's total bullshit. Um, yesterday I had the pleasure of seeing Scott Horton speak and he spoke for over an hour about the Afghanistan war. And he was talking about a specific area, but I think this can probably be extrapolated to the wider uh, Muslim world. When we went into this specific valley in Afghanistan, they thought we were the Russians. They didn't even know what the new world was. So to, to think that they are um, just hell-bent on attacking us is just a ridiculous notion because they, they don't, they're a very insular population. They, they don't know much about the West, aside from maybe what their leaders might tell them. And, and like I said, they, they literally thought the Americans coming down into their valley were the Russians returning from 20, 30 years ago, you know? So, um, but anyway, uh, maybe if anybody wants to add anything, uh, interrupt me here, but uh, I thought maybe another thing we can discuss was um, the UK, uh, because they recently... Uh, Jeff and I also talked about the free speech issues going on over there, and uh, as many people would know, uh, a guy named Count Dankula, um, was, he hasn't been sentenced yet, but he was convicted of essentially what amounts to a hate crime, a grossly offensive crime due to a, 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 a joke YouTube video he made. Um, so I'll throw it over to uh, Robert, I guess. Robert, did you... Did you see any of this? Are, are you aware of the situation with Count Dankula over there? Yeah, this is one of those things that made me not want to live in this world anymore. 
Um, <laughs> this has just, just made my blood boil. I mean, I know this has been going on for quite some time, and the law he's being prosecuted with is not a new one. I believe it's from 2004 or 2003, something like that. And it's been slowly creeping up. Um, in the U.K., more and more people are being arrested and thrown in jail or fined for, quote, offensive Facebook or social media posts. And this is, I guess, just probably the most, the latest and highest profile case. But it is really uh, just absurdly disgusting. Um, I was hoping to hear uh, Dave Smith talk about it because it is, you know, it's an issue that merges with comedy and freedom, which is really like his sweet spot. Um, and he did mention it briefly. Uh, hopefully on this next episode he'll really get into it because I just, I just, I'm angry about it and I want to hear other people be angry about it also. <laughs> Um, yeah, so he, he made this video where he taught his pug to see Kyle and to get really excited when he said, gas the juice. And it's clearly, even in the video itself, he talks about how it's a joke and he's just doing it to get a rise out of his girlfriend. But even if that's not the case, uh, the whole idea of free speech is to protect that which you find offensive. Uh, th that's the entire point of it. You don't need to protect bane, blame, you know, banal speech that everybody agrees is perfectly fine. Uh, this precedent is disgusting and horrifying, and I just, it makes me sad and weep for humanity that there is some judge out there who says, yeah, not only is this speech offensive and somehow hurting somebody? I mean, no victim, no crime. Who's who's the victim here? Who? Society. What, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what? <laughs> there's there's anyway, there, there were no um there were no complaints by the millions of people who actually viewed the video. Normal human beings look at it and either, you know, laugh or go, eh, it wasn't for me. But, you know, clearly this person's not like a danger to anybody. But these control freak thugs, uh, the cops in the area apparently took it upon themselves to seek out this guy. Um, now, I do want to point out, I've, I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, that he is a, a self-avowed or self-described communist, um, which would be kind of ironic if he wants i don't i don't i don't know anything about his politics so i'm not going to talk about that but anyway um yeah that some judge would you know say that this guy's a danger and that we need to throw him in a cage to teach him and punish him that this speech is not proper i i know germany and the uk and europe as a whole are becoming increasing and increasingly intolerant to free speech especially when it comes to like things about world war ii and it's just setting it up for repeat. I, you can't forget the past, people. I, if you start banning it, first of all, well, nah, I'll, I'll end it there. Um, anybody that feels no, no, like do, they want to jump in. Do your Orwell bit. Your Orwell bit's great. My Orwell bit? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, this is, this is the home. I mean, he would be spinning in his grave. This is the, the land of Orwell. He, <laughs> I mean... Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of gas. I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead Daniel. Well, um, so, so we actually had a, a chat with, um, with Drake. One of, uh, he's a member of the union, though he doesn't have a show yet. But he does have a site called Guide to Libertarianism, which is supposed to be like a summary and, and review of, of all the various libertarian podcasts and shows that are out there. But we had a chat with him yesterday, and he said that the decision by the judge, the judge actually said, um, I'm going to remove all context that this speech was given in and only look at what exactly was said and deem that as hate speech and make my decision based on that. So taking all the relevant context out of it. In what justice system does the context not matter? Doesn't mens, Patrick, isn't mens rea like a component of a crime? Isn't a victim a component of a crime? I mean, who's the victim here? The pug? Or the right. audience members who voluntarily watched the video? I don't understand this, so go ahead, Patrick. 
Well, the there's two components to a criminal offense. There's mens rea and the actus reus. And unless there's a strict liability offense, then the mens rea goes out the window. But mens rea basically means just the intent of the criminal because, you know, the, if you're punishing a crime and there's no, you know, that's why we punish homicide differently. Uh, first degree homicide, that's statutorily actually, but, you know, with a, a malice of forethought, is you know punished heavier so yeah it just it doesn't make any sense and I try not you know this this stuff gets me so mad <laughs> gets me so bad I don't try and think of like the gun control stuff too but I I actually I got to get going in the next five minutes here but yeah so just to talk about that I know in the UK the judges don't have judicial review which is the power to strike down unconstitutional laws so I assume that this is um, they could flag it. I mean, this is a district, probably a district level kind of thing. But yeah, I don't understand not not looking at the context of a speech because that that would seem highly probative towards his state of mind. And if mens re, you know, you need mens re and an ax, actus reus, well, the context would explain his mens re, which would be his state of mind at the time. So that's just ridiculous. I'd have to read the opinion, but. So, um, should I close up here, or Tony, did you have a question? Could I add uh, something real quick, uh, oh, yeah. just on, on to that? So, uh, the French former presidential candidate, I think, Marie Le Pen, was actually charged for tweeting out graphic pictures of ISIS crimes. Now, one of the really interesting things about this, and like what you're saying with taking away motivation, is a lot of people who live in these war zones and stuff like that are able to like record video or take pictures on their phone and then upload it to like a YouTube, Twitter, etc., and then delete it from their phone. This takes away the risk of being caught. If you know, you're know you living in an ISIS community, well, if you have a phone, they're probably going to kill you anyways. But in a less extreme, maybe Al-Nusra, Syrian, Assad Army type place, if you're walking around with video on your phone that shows soldiers killing people, then you're likely to face punitive judgment that evidence is going to be destroyed. And so now if you take the content out of this and people are posting videos of, you know, ISIS beheadings or whatever else, this could be important information, uh, you know, to prove war crimes and, and hold people accountable for these crimes. A lot of times this is the only evidence is what gets up, uploaded to YouTube, and et cetera. And so, you know, th this could really take away avenues from victims by, you know, enforcing these dumb laws. Well... Were you going to say something? I was just going to say, well, look, one of the reasons why, you know, the Vietnam War ended was because we had embedded reporters that were taking pictures of everything. You know, there's the famous girl with the melted skin who's, that was towards the end of the war, but the, I forget the name of that picture, but the girl with the melted skin. Anyways, Tony. No, I was just going to kind of piggyback off of uh, your conversation. Uh, the most egregious thing about this was uh, at the very top of his video, he explains his intention. It's not like there was anyone in any, any situation where they needed to guess what he was doing. The very first few words of it are, I'm doing this to piss off my girlfriend, so what I'm going to do is make my dog into the most uh, horrific thing I could think of, essentially. was So there was really no room to, to you know, wonder what he was doing there. However, I think some... In, in the, uh, the, the decision, he, the judge basically said, it's not up to you to decide the intent of the video. It's up to us to determine what your intent was. So I don't know how that legally makes sense, but maybe you can, before you jump off, you might want to comment on that, Pat. Yeah, it kind of sounds like an evidentiary issue. I mean, when you have... One of the best ways to determine what, how you prove a crime is to look at the jury instruction because it lays it out in layman's terms when they provide, and this gets into Lysander Spooner territory of how the government controls the trial because they determine what the jury instructions are, the court does. And I, I think the, the opposing counsels have an opportunity to draft what the jury instruction is, but ultimately I think the judge determines what the jury instructions are. So. Um, I'd have to look at the elements. There's certain elements to prove, and of this crime, just would have to determine what the elements are, I guess. Because uh, the statutory, if you look at the statutes, the statutes themselves don't say, okay, here are the elements you must meet to be convicted of this crime. I mean, they do 
parsed out really straightforward. So I, I would assume that one of them would be, you know, malintent. Another one would be the actus reus would be making the statement. And then usually you have to have a harm component too. But I, I'm just spitballing here because I haven't seen the actual thing. But I hope that answers your questions. Um, well, let me, I gotta, I gotta run because we're doing journal um, interviews, but I'll just wrap it up by giving a plug for my show if that's all right. Um, I haven't been doing much. Uh, I've been really busy with uh, school, and my parents told me to put Liberty Weekly on the back burner. <laughs> and I agree with that statement, so I'm doing one episode per week now. <laughs> I just released and recorded a quick snippet today, and I mentioned before we went on the mic uh, to Kyle how I think I might be doing, like, really quick videos, just 15 to 20 minutes, and I might just make that into the podcast itself. But I'm doing it exclusively on BitChute, so check me out at bitshoot.com forward slash Liberty Weekly. Also, join Mayway, which is a Facebook replacement that I've been hammering you guys in the face with. But it's functional. It's awesome. Check it out. I don't know, Trey. I'll, I'll pitch it to you. Have you tried it? Yeah. Uh, I actually added you. You are my sole contact on there right now. I haven't logged in since I joined. And <laughs> go, to the request, go to the voluntarist groups and then spam ad people. And people are super thrilled because they're, there's a lot of people joining and the UI is just as user-friendly and intuitive as the book is. So it works nice. just as well. I'll have to pick it up. And by right the way, that, that's uh, M-E-W-E dot com. I thought it was pronounced Mewe, but okay, Mewe. Well, if, if it's, I think it's, it might be German. If it's German, it's Mewe. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> we'll see. All right, well, I'm going to dip out. Uh, you guys have some fun. <laughs> Bye, Patrick. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Pat. Yeah. Later, Pat. Good to see you guys. You too. All right, and then, okay, the one thing that I wanted to say about this uh, Count Dankula thing is this sort of gives a little bit of, uh, sort of up the, the sort of nationalist movement in, the, in Europe, what they consider the alt-right over there, right? Because you have this sort of, you know, it's really kind of a funny joke. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I thought it was kind of funny. Like when it when this story broke, uh, when he initially got arrested for it, I was like, man, that sounds like something I would have done when I was younger. I mean, I might even still do it if I felt so inclined because, I don't know, it just wasn't, I don't think, okay, yeah, you could say it was in poor taste, but I like dark humor. I like humor that pushes the boundaries. I think most of us who are normal people do. But um, then you have you have a lot of situations in the UK where there's actually there there are like Muslims who are on the street saying some pretty hateful stuff and they're left alone, you know? So when you get situations where it almost looks like there's a double standard for horrific speech uh, being considered hate speech from one group because of their demographic or their race or their ethnicity or their religion, whatever it is, and they give a pass to certain people and uh, it's just completely inconsistent. I mean, uh, I don't know. What do you think about that, Tony? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not really sure. I've been thinking about this whole UK thing a lot lately because it goes beyond the whole Count Dankula situation. Um, we covered it in our, in our episode. Like, the UK is starting to to ban people who they don't want to hear from, uh, especially these, like, nationalist types that you talked about. I mean, they recently banned uh, the alt-right or alt-light uh, figurehead Lawrence Southern. They uh, kicked out a few others who are, like, I guess, identitarian, Euro European identitarians. Um, and uh, somebody brought up Orwell before. The interesting thing is they wanted to go to Speaker's Corner in London to discuss, to, to which is kind of like the last bastion of free speech in London, a place where you can literally go and stand on a soapbox and just uh, just let your thoughts fly. Whatever you say goes. It's like kind of like, I don't know if it's, it's actually enshrined legally, but it is kind of an understanding um, amongst the authorities that as long as you're not calling for violence, you can go there and just speak. And um, the U.K. government is, has decided to... Uh, ban certain people who just wanted to go to that place and speak speak their thoughts. So I, it, it is worrying to me that um, 
cultures like uh, Anglo cultures that are kind of like the backbone of you know British common law and Western civilization are starting to regress from this uh, freedom of expression thing. Um, it's it's very scary, and Jeff and I covered it on the last episode of Don't Waste Your Hate. It's like some I, I used to Jeff said it uh, better than I did, but the 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 basic thought was you know it used to look at the, the American Constitution and think that it was superfluous or it doesn't really do anything, but then when you look at what's going on over in England and Scotland and the UK. And then you look here, it's like, hey, at least we have this First Amendment enshrined, written down, and we actually have some uh, Supreme Court decisions that have held it up. Now, not to say that it's, it's going to always stay that way, but the point is, like, they don't have a First Amendment over there, and it's, it's starting to show that, um, you know, like someone said, Orwell will be turning in his grave, but, you know, people aren't allowed to say certain things over there anymore. And it's, it's just, it's very scary, especially for you know, like an English culture that that's happening over there. I mean, you, you kind of think about these things in like German cultures or uh, places like Russia in the past, but, you know, for, for an English culture to be suppressing speech in this way, and Canada too, um, it's it's pretty scary. Um, I guess I'll throw it over to Kyle. What, what do you think? Kyle, you there, buddy? Oh, he's talking, but I don't hear anything. Yeah, your mic's off, Kyle. Your lips are moving, but I can't hear nothing. I've been physically abused in the ear. That's our latest episode on the Actual Anarchy podcast, number 69, actualanarchy.com slash 69, Billy Madison. I'm figuring that out. Um, (laughs) Yeah, this is absolutely, uh, you know, thought crime, which is what Orwell warned about. And uh, I don't trust the government to clean toilets, let alone decide what is and is not offensive speech. Um... So, Kyle, you there, buddy? Hello. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. There he is. All right. Awesome. Like I was saying before, it, it's, you know, the whole unintended consequences thing. You know, you end up passing a law like this thinking that you're just going to stop some guy from posting some dumb YouTube video where he, you know, turns his dog into a little Nazi. And those things, you know, probably aren't super healthy for a culture to have. And uh, I think, you know, generally stated like i don't want to hang out with the guy that's turning his dog into a nazi but you know that's just my opinion on the matter and i'm not gonna like you know watch his youtube content or anything like that i think everybody could just go about fine ignoring him because the issue is is that if you outlaw that then you know if suddenly you start outlawing the most ridiculous kind of things where now you can't post graphic content on YouTube, and then you know you lose all of this evidence that are victims of war crimes, or you know evidence of war crimes and stuff like this, and, and so it could turn into a real problem real easy. And we're already seeing that. I mean, I don't think Marie Le Pen was necessarily, um, you know, tweeting the videos of ISIS atrocities because she was concerned about the victims, but at the same time. I tweet them for that reason because I'm concerned about the victims because I want to say, hey, this is what's going on over there. And so suddenly I'm going to be silenced uh, because it, motivation doesn't matter. And because I tweeted the same thing that somebody else did that, you know, that makes me you know guilty because of the censorship laws. And so, you know, I say they're well-intentioned. I, I generally think that's probably not true, too, that this is about, you know, more control, especially from on behalf of the politicians. But that's the way they sell it. But even, you know, good intentions, it's not going to turn out that way. Yeah, people that support this and champion this almost never seem to understand that it will very soon be used against them. I've got a, I've got a friend who I share, like, outrageous articles with, and I sent him this one, and he loved it. He thought this law was a fantastic idea. Because he imagined in his fantasy-prone brain that on Trump's next visit, he would be arrested and thrown in jail for offensive speech. And the idea that a guy like Trump would you know, suffer the fate of this law before he would is, is laughable. Uh, so, um, Daniel, you got anything? I do, yeah. So my comment regarding this see if I can remember it, um, <laughs> uh, is that if you guys have ever seen the movie Starship Troopers, it's 
based on a, a Robert Heinlein book, but the movie producers actually deviated quite a bit from the concept of the of the novel. But the point that the movie makers were trying to make was that nobody at the time sees themselves as the bad guy. And it's only after things have been going along and continuing to expand and grow that the realization happens that they're actually doing hor horrific things. And that's the exact same thing that happened in Nazi Germany. Hitler was praised for a decade before World War II. He was Time's Man of the Year. He was responsible for the economic miracle in Germany. The people who were listening to him and following him were being uplifted in a nationalistic sense. They thought that they were doing good, and it is only after the narrative gets changed where he's, and, and that whole ideology is seen as evil. And I see the same type of thing happening with this progressive uh, outgrowth of stifling speech and uh, quieting dissent and all of these things, that they're using tactics that if in the hands of the opposition, they would deem as evil. And it won't be long before they are turned against them, similar to a border wall like we were just talking about with East Germany and, and the, the uh, border wall with Mexico and keeping out immigrants. It's not that difficult to turn the direction around and say, okay, it was meant to keep people out, but now it's keeping people in. And so I'll pass it back to Trey uh, with those comments. Yeah, so <clears throat> I don't know. I think we've kind of exhausted uh, the whole UK thing. And I don't know, the UK is sort of, uh, sort of an enigma to me. I don't quite understand. You know, I, it's almost like they're experiencing this big pendulum swing after experiencing fascism, you know, during World War II. Now it's like they're swinging the other way and it's not, it's like this whole centrist mixed economy sort of progressive uh, culture that's taken over and that's the only correct opinion to have over there. And I don't know, it just seems like so terrible. But now in, uh, in America, what we've got with, so this weekend as we're recording this, the March for Our Lives thing is going on. And I don't know, did you guys see this where there was uh, this David Hogg guy, this kid got, he was, he was mad about the whole clear backpacks thing, right? And uh, he was saying that it was a violation of his First Amendment rights when it's really your Fourth Amendment rights, you know, to have no unlawful search and seizure of your, of your belongings or whatever. So, so he was saying something about how it was a violation of his First Amendment rights to have privacy. And it just shows that not only, A, like these kids went to this Parkland district school that was, uh, you know, really well-funded and everything like that, and they can't even teach them basic constitutional law stuff, like just the basic, you know, first 10 amendments, <laughs> you know, they can't even teach them just the basic tenets of, uh, of our legal structure in America, but they want to lecture us on how we can amend the second amendment to whatever whims that they feel like they want, which let's just be frank about it. I, I just wish that they would come out and be honest about it, that they want all guns taken away from all citizens and put into the hands of a bureaucratic class, you know, uh, just one class of people. So, See, I don't know. What are your guys' frustrations right now? Uh, because for me, it's like uh, almost all of it, you know, most of my friends in real life and family in real life are progressives, like a majority of them. So it's just nonstop. You're nothing but a, a kid killer if you <laughs> don't want to uh, do, you know, do any of this legislation to restrict gun rights. So. Uh, yeah, what's uh, your experience been, Robert? I know that you like to engage with uh, with uh, with people online there on that topic. Well, I hate to paint uh, too, with too broad a brush, but these people that really seem to be fascists, I, I don't want to turn into like an anti fascist person where he's seeing a fascist with everybody they disagree with. But, you know, it's kind of delicious where these progressive anti-gunners are in this position where almost unilaterally 
not only do they want their gun rights taken away, but they also want – they also believe that you know, Trump is literally Hitler. So which <laughs> is it? And, and they have apparently decided that they are so much rather you know, have their guns taken away – and it's okay, you know, they don't mind if Trump takes them. And so, like you said, it's, they're really for gun consolidation. They, they just don't trust other people and, and sometimes even themselves. Have you seen those situations on Facebook where there's like some moron who's like, in order to make a safer world, I'm, taking, I'm destroying my own weapon? If that isn't the most self-damning statement, like he doesn't even trust himself with it or what? what I don't yeah, I'm close to I'm close to these people, and uh, there it's a whole family of like progressive uh, folks. And I was getting lectured one night that even me having a gun in the house uh, makes it unsafe uh, for me because you know uh, the chance of of you dying from a weapon if it's in your house goes up like fourfold. And I was like, yeah, but that's because of suicide statistics. So you're you're telling me that I shouldn't have a weapon because you're worried that I'm going to kill myself with it? Like you really just think that little of me that I don't know that that yeah. you can't trust me to not kill myself with it if I have it, you know? So I don't know. I, I mean, these people just they they try to feign that they're for liberty in this abstract sense, but really they're uh, there would be totalitarians that want to just uh, proxy all of their rights because they don't feel like they are in a, a position to be responsible for their own safety. And I love the tact that um, actually Daniel used recently where you're, you're arguing with an anti-gun person and you really got to out progressive them, I think as a really good fun tactic to be like, well, why do you hate women so much? Because really guns are the main equalizer in any kind of physical confrontation between men and women. Um, you know, women, it, they need to, it, you know, take down an attacker at range. They're not going to be able to do that with mace or any other, like a knife or a, something like that. Um, they really need to be able to take down an attacker at range and get away. Um, so if you take away handguns, which I know nobody's really saying handguns, although they should because handguns are responsible for far more deaths than quote-unquote assault rifles, whatever that word even means. Um, so, yeah, I, I like the idea of just going, so why do, you, why do you hate women? What do you have against them? Do you want, do you want more rapes to happen? Are you pro-rape? What's, what's going on here? Yeah, I thought they were all pro-equality, but not when it comes to equalizing force, right? Defensive force yeah, there's versus even a, the initiatory what, the force. The 38 Special was the equalizer, right? Yeah, yeah, it makes the frail uh, old lady equivalent to a, a spry, you know, menacing man who wants to mug her or, or kill her or whatever. All right. So, yeah, it's just, it's just really upsetting and frustrating. Um, they seem to think that it's common sense, but what, what, is, what does that have to do with my freedom to defend myself? I, do they not see that they're fascists? I, yeah. You know, I, I just want to take off on the whole Second Amendment argument. Um, a lot of people try to say, well, you're not part of a militia, and it says well-regulated right in the text, so therefore it means it can be regulated. What they don't seem to understand is a couple of things. One is well-regulated at the time meant well-equipped, and the intention of it was to be equal to or, or better equipped than any potential tyrannical government because they just got done throwing one off. So why the hell would they sign a thing and make a bill, make a right, or um, protect a right, a natural right that already exists, uh, shackle the government from impinging upon it, uh, a right that allows you to throw off and defend yourselves from a tyrannical government. It makes no sense at all. And I don't think that these people realize that um, <clears throat> the Second Amendment, just the, the cultural context of a lot of people in America owning guns actually keeps them safe or has, at least in the past, their ancestors kept them safe. Uh, many would-be invaders of America have lamented that, um, that we are well-armed and that it would be incredibly hard to fight any sort of insurgency to take over America. So, um, and even just in the context of uh, places 
in America that are that have a lot of gun ownership see a lot less crime because crooks realize that they have to go to the inner city where uh, where little to nobody carries a gun uh, because of either laws or culture or whatever it is. Um, so, and I think a lot of the people who who are preaching to us about uh, the the gun violence problem do actually live in places that are well armed and they're sort of speaking from this ivory tower what whether they're armed by their neighbors or just a well-funded uh, police department I think that they uh, completely disregard that guns are actually keeping them safe uh, so I find it kind of ironic that they're trying to preach to us about you know just that whole double standard that they have yeah, I want to dive yeah, in with, with a meme that I saw real quick, and then, and then Robert, to you. Um, there's a meme that uh, someone's calling 911 like, hey, someone's breaking into my house. Can you please send, send someone over with more rights than I have to protect me? <laughs> yeah, all you have to do to know that guns keep you safer is to look at what the murder capitals of the country are. I mean, essentially, Chicago, where there oh. is – where all the – citizens, the law-abiding citizens have been disarmed, and back in when D.C. had their handgun ban, and th those two places were murder holes. So it, it seems pretty self-evident that you get rid of guns out of law-abiding citizens' hands, and you see murder skyrocket. Because, like you said, I mean, crooks have nothing to fear. If they see a gun-free zone sign, they're like, sweet, I've got 15, 20, 30 minutes to kill as many people as I want, or break into the home and know that they're going to have a massive power advantage over any defender. Yeah, and then while we're all being distracted by the March for Our Lives controversy and uh, the, the whole gun debate, this, this omnibus thing looks like it's uh, like a train just running through and looks like it's going to pass. And, you know, Rand Paul's been out there kind of exposing uh, the the parts of this uh, I don't know actually did this pass can someone uh, I thought, the signed, it. Yeah, I thought Trump signed it yesterday didn't he yeah okay. yeah it was passed and signed you know it's like we might as well have had Hillary Clinton honestly yeah exactly now we got John yeah, Bolton as the uh, foreign policy <laughs> we got uh, the omnibus yeah, yeah even our so. boy uh, even our boy Stephen Molyneux uh, seems pretty pissed about it he uh, he said the same thing I guess Hillary's here now right so you know it's 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 pretty crazy. It's been a it's been a bad few weeks for for liberty. If you're if you're looking at uh, what the U.S. government has done, both in both in um, Congress and at the executive level, uh, somebody brought up Bolton, so uh, maybe we should go into that. I mean, Kyle, what? Uh, I'm scared, man. What What are your thoughts on Bolton? <laughs> yeah, what What's his history? Why should we be afraid of him? And why is he worse or 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 equal to McMaster, who he's replacing? Yeah, has he been right in the past a lot of times, or what? <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that John Bolton still thinks that John Bolton is right on the Iraq War. Um, now I was just looking today, and way back in 2000 and fit, or well, in 2004 or 2000, yeah, 2004, John Bolton was busy lying the U.S. into the Afghan War, uh, along with the U.K., saying that uh, Niger was selling. Uh, the Iraqis and Saddam Hussein, yellow cake uranium, scaring every American citizen that a dirty bomb was going to go off in the center of their city because Saddam Hussein gave it to Osama bin Laden uh, because those two, you know, allegedly talked all the time, right? So it's a joke. Oh, but then uh, as recently as 2015, you know, John Bolton is still saying that he's glad that Saddam Hussein died. Of course, this is 2015. So the Islamist state holds, you know, Palmyra, they hold Raqqa, they hold Mosul, the second largest city in uh, I Afghanistan, uh, the, you know, Tikrit, Fallujah, Ramadi. You know, at one point they were threatening Baghdad. And yet it, John Bolton still sitting there saying, well, Osama bin Laden is worse than the caliph, right? And this is somebody who is, you know, supposed to kind of be like a bad knight and scared of Muslims. He's just... I don't want to say he's insane because uh, apparently he is somewhat intelligent and could put this stuff together. But at the same time, it, it's like, I don't know, can he not see the destruction of his own policies and actions? Because they're right there in front of him. I mean, the, the Mosul is still rubble because John Bolton lied us into war and we have fight two battles now for that city. 
I thought that uh, Bolton was the one who was pushing the narrative for like the caravan of chemical weapons labs that were driving around Iraq. I didn't realize that he was involved in the yellow cake narrative. I thought that that was like, uh, I thought that that was, uh, what's his name, Powell? I thought that was like mostly his, like, his baby, but. Guys, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Can so at explain? least was involved with it, but yeah. What is the yellow cake narrative? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so, ignorant on this. Yeah. Yellow cake uranium, I guess, is like enriched uranium that could you know be used to make a nuclear bomb or a dirty bomb. And so I, I guess that maybe back in 2003, maybe I was too late when I said 2004, the U.K., I think, came out with a report that said uh, Saddam Hussein was either trying or was able to buy yellow cake uranium from Niger. And, uh, you know, what, what he did with it, we don't know. But, you know, he, you know, he has connections with Osama bin Laden. So your city could be next, right? And uh, and that was the whole narrative. And, yeah, I think Paul pushed that at the U.N. tray. But, it, oh, yeah. Bolton was involved and was heading over and having conversations with British intelligence while that report was being developed. Uh, hmm. So he was certainly involved in that. And I know he was big on chemical and biological weapons at that time. I think at one point he even tried to convince Bush that uh, the Cubans were trying to export biological weapons. And so, I mean, he just sees it everywhere. Well, you know, he, he doesn't agree with the one China policy, so I'm sure he's going to pick a fight with China over Taiwan. Uh, he says all North Koreans are liars and, you know, Trump shouldn't trust Kim Jong-un. And even his, his expectations for the uh, deal there are completely ridiculous. He's saying that what Trump should go in and tell Kim Jong-un is we're sending ships and planes in a couple of weeks. You're going to load up all your nuclear weapons on it in a Libyan-style denuclearization, wink, wink, and take away all your <laughs> nuclear bombs. Well, of course, Kim Jong-un is going to say, well, the last time that happened, yeah, so, uh, Muammar Gaddafi got sodomized to death with a bayonet. So I'm definitely not going to do that. And uh, so, you know, Bolton, I think, is, is I don't know if he's going to be able to ruin that summit, but he's going to give it a shot. I guess uh, while we're on foreign policy, too, I had a, uh... I was complaining about Bolton on my Facebook, and this progressive um, commented. Um, I ended up getting into a, a thread with him, and he was trying to like tell me that, um, you know, I was kind of being all doom and gloom about John Bolton getting in there, and um, basically the conversation ended up coming down to a lot of stuff about Iran and Russia Gate, and he was trying to tell me that Trump's uh, that that Trump's Iran hawkishness on, on the Iran deal is all political theater and that it's just basically him counteracting the Russiagate narrative. And the only reason why he's uh, hawkish on Iran is just so that he can look like he's not Putin's puppet. I mean, literally, this is what this guy was trying to say. And he was trying to say that he's, that he's going to have to rein Bolton in and keep Bolton from, like, Helping him renege on the deal with hey, Trey, the Trey, entire reason. Trey, the entire reason why. Go ahead. Trey. Yeah. Sorry, your your microphone has turned to to shit for a moment. Um, it's happened oh. to me in the past, so what I've had to do is disconnect the mic and then reconnect it. Okay. I don't mean to um, derail you. You were you were on fire, but we can't yeah. hear you very well. Can you hear me better now? No, not yet. Very staticky. In the meantime, I just want to say like, that. Um, I, uh, I was Still yeah, it's better. Oh, was it? Oh, was it? Go, okay, go, sorry. go ahead. Keep talking. Okay, do I sound better now? No. No, garbage. Okay, no. okay, go ahead, guys. You might need to disconnect and reconnect. Right. Sadly. See you, right, well, Trey. This is the live show, everyone. <laughs> in the meantime, uh, I, I just want to mention, uh, I did get a chance uh, to speak to Scott Horton yesterday. Uh, we sat down and... Unfortunately, I didn't record anything, but the point is um, he let me know that he thinks Bolton is um, a pretty bad idea, but he also, we also wanted to make it clear to me, like, hey, listen, Saddam Hussein, he was a piece of shit, you know, like, no getting around that he was a good guy, but it's not a good idea for, like, libertarians to take that tact and start saying, yeah, Saddam Hussein, he's like, listen, I, I don't like Saddam Hussein. I know he did a lot of horrible things. However, um, 
if I go, if I, I, I there's there's volumes and volumes of, of stuff that can corroborate that. But I don't want to get on record and start talking about Saddam Hussein all the time because then that just feeds into the narrative that Bolton is trying to create, which is that regime change was good, it was necessary, and the fact is uh, it did result in something terrible. So this, as much as Saddam Hussein was a terrible guy, like it's not really a, a point worth worth discussing at this point because Bolton is just looking to take us in even a further direction because Bolton very clearly doesn't care about the results of his policies because he's totally fine with what happened with Saddam Hussein getting taken out and then the power vacuum and then ISIS coming in. He's totally fine with that. And, you know, that's um, that's just pretty telling as far as, you know, what we might be in for with this guy coming in because he it, it's like a Madeleine Albright situation where, oh, yeah, well, all of the death and destruction that we caused was worth it, you know. Um, I'll pass it to Trey. Hopefully his mic is good. Yeah, do I sound better now? Yeah. I do. Yeah. Okay. Huh, I don't know what happened there. I wonder if the mic switched to one of my other mics, either my laptop or my uh, uh, webcam. But anyway, I was trying to uh, basically tee up something for Kyle here. And uh, basically with with all that information that I just gave, that this progressive was just basically trying to say that um, that he was actually basically doing the whole Scott Adams thing and saying that Trump is playing like 4D chess and his hawkishness on Iran is just all this huge like game to this political gamesmanship game where he's just trying to uh, basically be in Putin's back pocket while uh, screaming at Iran. When I'm really sitting here just thinking, I think the only reason that he's hawkish on Iran is because he watches Fox News. Fox News. I don't think that he's. It's because he's a Russian puppet. I think it's just because he's a typical conservative that watches Fox News. So I mean, like, what's your take on this? What, it, like, do you really think that Bolton is going to be restrained by Trump because of the Russia Gate narrative? Um, no, <laughs> I think it'll, if anything, it'll make it worse. And of course, the funny thing is too that if Trump was trying to keep the nuclear deal in place or was trying to do a missile deal with Iran and improve relations with that country, then he would be a puppet of Putin for wanting to make relationships there better. I mean, it's the same thing you have with Rex Tillerson when he was first uh, nominated to be Secretary of State. Everybody said, "Oh, this is because of the evil Russian influence," and then he gets fired, and everybody says, "Oh, this is because of the evil." Russian influence and and so obviously at this point it's it's absolutely just hysteria I uh, I was watching a video in the ad before it was a Smirnoff vodka commercial and they had uh, a lot of people think our vodka is made in Russia but it's actually made in the US and I was like oh wow so we're really this far like where people aren't going to drink vodka because it's made in Russia or something like oh, that it's freedom vodka now <laughs> like freedom fries <laughs> <laughs> but I don't. I, I disagree with that whole Scott Adams argument that the that Trump is just trying to take a super hardline position because a lot of people are making this about North Korea right now, saying that oh Trump scared the North Koreans to the table. I'm not sure that's what happened. I think the North Koreans convinced the world that they have a legitimate nuclear deterrent, and that's why the North Koreans are coming from the to the table because they I think they finally feel like they're going to be uh, bargaining from a position where the end result won't be Libya. Um, can I, can so, I spin I uh, what Tony had said back to you, Kyle? Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right, so regime, regime change, getting uh, Saddam out of there, was apparently a good thing, according to Bolton, and, and Horton doesn't want to get like mired down into that. But isn't it true that Hussein, Saddam Hussein was actually installed and supported by the U.S. government in the conflict with Iran back in the 80s? So, yeah, I mean, it's like I'm they not... put him in and then they they want him out. So it's like, you know, talk about meddling in the affairs of another country. Like everyone's all upset about Russia potentially like serving some Facebook ads that might have swayed the election against Hillary. Um, but isn't there like a backstory to this whole thing where the U.S. meddles in so many and, and Saddam Hussein is, is just one example of it? Right. After the 79 revolution, the Iranian revolution, suddenly Iran became not within the U.S. orbit 
and the U.S. looked to punish Iran, and the easiest way to do that was by arming their longtime oh. enemy, uh, Saddam Hussein, who was – I am I think Saddam took power of Iraq. I'm not sure if he did that with how much American help. Uh, I'm sure the CIA was involved all over the place, so there was probably some involvement. But I'm not sure how much of that you could attribute directly to the U.S. action. But that being said, yeah, we sold uh, Saddam tons of weapons afterwards and, you know, helped field his war against the Iranians. At times, we've really meddled in I Iraq. Uh, like during the, I think, the first Bush war, the first Iraq war, we had kind of given the Shia in Iraq the green light to do an uprising against Saddam. And then we changed our minds, and so a whole bunch of Shia died. And I think this happened in Iraqi Kurdistan as well, a very similar situation. And so we've been meddling there the whole time. Uh, Iraq has never been a country free of U.S. intervention, even in the years between the two Bushes, when you have Bill Clinton. Uh, that, you know, they killed 500,000 Iraqi children just by you know, starving them in medication. And we had airstrikes against Iraq that whole time. And so, you know, I, the U.S., at least for the past 25 years or so, has been bombing Iraq the whole time. I'd just like to add uh, to Kyle's point that I, I do know for sure that America was backing uh, Saddam during the Reagan administration. And this was actually when he was, quote unquote, gassing his own people, uh, which I want to say it was in northern Iraq where he was quelling a rebellion. Um, and we kind of turned the other way and uh, allowed it to happen. And then come 2000, uh, uh, post 9-11, 2000s, uh, we were talking about that as a legitimate reason to go and invade Iraq and overthrow Saddam when we didn't give a damn when he was our guy, when he was on our side during the end of the Cold War. So, I mean, yeah, let's just, like be honest about it at least that this wasn't a problem for us until it was convenient. I mean, uh, and why would it be? How many people have the, did the United States torture? How many of those people were tortured to death? How many children, innocent children, even, you know, say that they, you know, on the most ridiculous alt-right terms become dangerous at the age of eight. How about a five-year-old? How many five-year-olds and under have been killed by the U.S. wars overseas? I'm sure more than Saddam Hussein ever killed, right? So, you know, I guess it's just, you know, by, by what standard are you, know, you asking if it, who's a terrible person or not? George Bush certainly is, but he's still living on a ranch in a mansion, you know, receiving Secret Service support and the best health care in the world. So, yeah, he's he's being protected by guns. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, does anyone have a? Um, can we direct uh, back to Robert? I think we haven't heard from him in a little while. Well, sure. Uh, this just speaks to the idea that. A case for war could be actually literally made against any leader of any country in the world at any given time. Um, Xi Jinping, I believe, just did it remove term limits, so now he's essentially president for life. Um, Maduro, um, any, I mean, you could name any leader of any country and find some sort of dirt or manufacture some sort of dirt. Uh, it's really just the source is this perpetual war machine. So, I mean, even if the wars in Afghanistan tomorrow ended and Iraq ended, and I, of course I want those things to stop, of course, bring the troops home and forget this whole bullshit, but they'll just find another excuse to invade another country to keep the war machine and the profits coming in for the, you know, the defense contractors and all the, the, the wheels that are getting greased in Washington. Um, I, the, the, the I mean, we, the people I'm talking to right now, all of, a, you know, of course, know that the real answer is this belief in authority and the idea that government can solve any kind of problem whatsoever, and that's why you've got to shrink it down and get rid of it entirely and just walk away and stop supporting this, this horrificness. But I really don't see, with the current, I mean, whether you have Bolton in there, of course he's terrible, but even if you don't, even if you don't have Bolton or if you've got anybody else in there, uh, the war machine continues. Um, every president, essentially, short of, say, Clinton, Hillary Clinton, or like John McCain or somebody like that, I guess, has really kind of run in the least lately. I know Trump has run as an anti-war candidate. Obama ran as an anti-war candidate. And what do they do? 
They continued all the wars of the Bush administration. I mean, nobody's, nobody's stopping this, this machine. So I just, I'm really pessimistic about the whole thing. I don't, I, I don't see a time in which the United States, before it collapses, is it, it ever at peace in my lifetime? I hope it is. But as soon as one war ends, another is going to start with whatever manufactured enemy there is. Well, you um, always need an enemy, Robert. And, and to your point about their platform being anti-war, it goes, FDR was anti-war. He's going to keep us out of World War II. Wilson was anti-war. He's going to keep us out of World War I. Lincoln was anti-war. He's going to keep us, you know, out of whatever. It, it's just the people, I think, in general want peace and, and no war. Uh, it's only once they're in the war than this nationalistic, um, identitarian, and tribalism kind of takes over, and people are like in in the in group saying, "I got to support whatever my countrymen are doing or whatever." So it's it's kind of unfortunate. But I'll go back to you. Can well, I just yeah, add you know, that, 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 that like the fear aspect? I think is what drives the nationalism, right? It wasn't that Americans suddenly turned against Iraq. It's that we were told that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, and they strongly implied, if not outright said, that they were, he was going to give them to uh, Osama bin Laden, and then they're going to go blow up a city in America. In fact, in Cincinnati's speech, I think that uh, President Bush said just about that. He said that we can't wait anymore because the smoking gun that you're looking for may be a mushroom cloud over an American city. And I so, did like the Chappelle reference where he says, how do we know that they have weapons of mass destruction? Because we have the receipt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fear makes people stupid, man. Um, you keep people population afraid and they'll go along with whatever. It's, it's terrifying. Hey, Trey, hey, uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, but uh, is there any other um, topics you want to hit? Well, so one thing I I wanted to circle back to the gun thing. Before. Abort, abort. I think your uh, mic is uh, again? failing again. I think so. Oh my. Yeah, you're crapping out. How about you, Daniel? Uh, repeat the question, sir. I'm just wondering, is there any other uh, any other topic you want to hit? We've jumped from thing to thing. I know we've been going for a little over an hour now. I don't know uh, how much longer we, we everybody has, but. Is there any other major issues that uh, have come up for you? Well, we touched on the omnibus. We touched, touched upon gun control. We didn't mention bump stocks, but I think that that's, I don't know, kind of like not as big of a deal. I mean, you can use a rubber band to recreate the same effect. Uh, so, you know, and, and you can print one 3D printer. So a, a ban on selling them is not really like a thing. And criminals aren't going to follow the, the laws anyway. And they're not going to obey the signs that are up that says, like, gun-free zone, no bump stock zone, what have you. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of other things. I, I did think it was interesting with the, um, the David Hogg thing. I mean, the guy has been on this whirlwind tour for five, six weeks now, begging for people to have their other people's rights taken away. And then he has the gall to then complain about his alleged rights being violated by these clear backpacks, and I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, a little bit of irony, like like does that mean that people are protesting for free health care, free college, free whatever, like more government, and there's a, a police officer spraying them with mace and the can says more government? I think that's pretty ironic. Yeah, I mean, any honest reading of the Constitution would uh, prove that all of these uh, gun control advocates are just being ridiculous. And it is pretty rich when those same advocates then appeal to the Constitution for the other bullshit that they don't like, such as, in this case, the clear backpacks, you know. I, uh, I find it rich as hell. To, I mean, if you're going to be one of these progressives who – uh, view the Constitution as a living document that can be changed at will or reinterpreted to, um, with consideration to modern circumstances as opposed to an originalist interpretation, then I, I don't understand why you would ever even appeal to the Constitution. Or um, why have it at all. Yeah, exactly. What's, what's the there's, point? No, 
the idea of a living constitution means that there should just be no constitution. And that's kind of the problem in England, right? That they don't have a written constitution as far as I know. And I think that might be part of the reason, not to say that constitution is a, a fix all kind of solution because it clearly is not any, any uh, voluntarist would, uh, would understand that. But um, there is no denying that, I guess, having the First Amendment here, again, like I said before, does at least create some kind of friction there. Um, but, you know, these people, it's like, you know, don't appeal to the Constitution for one thing and then shit on it for another uh, in the very same breath. It just, it doesn't work for me. What about you, Trey? Uh, first of all, do I sound okay? Okay. <laughs> um, so the reason I, I kind of wanted to circle back on the guns again was just because uh, uh, this once again has held up a mirror to Donald Trump for what he really is. Um, he's giving in to the whole populist sentiment of we need to do something, right? Uh, because he's out there. He was he was saying, you know, he was bitching about Obama letting us have too many gun rights by having this accessory called a bump stock. You know, so it's just kind of like, I, like this guy, any prospect that we had of any sort of protection of, or, you know, at least putting a red light to, to growth of government um, and preserving any kind of liberty going forward, I think is sort of in shambles at this point. So I guess I just wanted to highlight again, you know, there's that and then there's tariffs that uh, that came up in the past month here. So, yeah, um, pretty abysmal as far as the administration goes. Uh, we've got John Bolton in, so I guess uh, just to bring it to a nice uh, round end, I mean, obviously the problems that are going on right now um, culturally and politically in America, not Donald Trump's fault necessarily, but he's certainly a symptom of it, right? And you can see people that are, by their last dying breath, supporting him, <laughs> saying that this is exam another example of him just appeasing people for this sort of long-term goal that he has. And uh, I'm just not seeing it. I'm not seeing him. I'm not seeing any sort of systematic thought here. I'm seeing him being pushed by the the uh, the way of the wind, as it were. So, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, what do you think, Robert? Uh, just on those closing thoughts. Well, I, yeah, I don't know if this has happened. Like for sure, I know I, I, I saw I thought I saw an article that said uh, Trump, Trump is floating a tariff on China, which is about the stupidest thing that I could imagine him doing. I mean, in the series of stupid things. But he knows that. I mean, China's not our biggest trade partner, but it's one of the biggest, and all it does is make Americans wealthier. It, it creates nice, cheap, inexpensive goods that improves everybody's lives. And the idea that he's going to come in and go, no, we've got to make that more expensive so that, what, American goods are better or can be compete more? Who cares about that crap? That, he has no understanding of economics. But circling back to the gun thing and what Daniel said about the 3D printing, um, the good news is that the, one of the best tools for fighting government tyranny is technology. And I guess recently, like the first all-metal handgun was 3D printed. Used to be the, they were just making them out of substrates and like plastics. And especially if you're, you got like the receiver, it's not going to last very long. Um, but now that you can do the entire thing out of metal, uh, this is just pure anarchy, baby. You gotta love it. Uh, no serial numbers. Um, of course, I'm sure they're gonna. Government's gonna make some dumb law, but you, I'm sorry, you can't stop it. You can't stop it, man. It's yeah, a beautiful actual, thing. actual anarchy, baby. That's right. You can make any law you want. Doesn't matter. You know, and the funny thing on the the tariffs is that um, that we run a trade deficit with China, but that's actually a sign of our economic, um, you know, that we're sort of, that people are willing to take us into a deficit and still trade goods with us. You know what I mean? Like kind of shows that they'll still trade with us even though we run a deficit with them 
So it sort of shows dominance in the market anyway. So I'm not really sure. Maybe I just don't understand this issue well enough, but it seems to me that uh, that it's that China isn't actually the uh, Dre man. Your your microphone, buddy. Sorry. Damn it. Okay. Well, anyway, um, I'll just sign off at this point then, because um, <laughs> I'm just having so many problems. Thank you to all of the Libertarian Union listeners, and thanks to all of you guys. All right. Thanks, thanks Trey. Man. And and your your site is uh, subversionwebcast.com, correct? Correct. All right, so everyone check out Trey at subversionwebcast.com. I'll, I'll take over uh, hostly duties to wind us down. Um, let's just touch on one other question with everyone, and like, what's the thing that you've done in the past month with your show that you want to mention and then give the audience um, your credentials on you know, how they can find your show and, and your websites and all that stuff. So we'll do a closeout kind of, kind of round here, and I'll go to, um, I'll go to Kyle Anselone first. All right, so I've been busy this month, so it's going to take me. I, uh, Immersion News is up and running. Uh, that is my brand new news website. I, uh, you all should check it out. I m m e r s i o n n e w s dot com. Uh, all the like news that I'm going through. Uh, I specialize in foreign policy, but I try to cover all the stuff that libertarians care about: police abuse, etc. I got an uh, article published that I co-authored with Will Porter. Uh, I ran in consor- consortium news and I also ran antiwar.com, uh, focusing on what the huge opium crop in Afghanistan means uh, for the coming spring offensive uh, and the Afghan war as it's you know kind of gained into 17 years now or something crazy like that. And then uh, the big thing I'm proud of on the show is uh, actually my second to last episode. I 171. Foreign Policy Focus 171, and that is the heroism of Ahed Tamimi, who is a a young Palestinian girl activist currently going to spend eight months after having uh, in prison after having to go through a military court in Israel. And she really uh, does a good job of standing up for the rights of you know her fellow Palestinians, and uh, it's awesome to see what she was doing. So I I had a real cool opportunity gain to kind of you know profile that situation. All right, very good. Well, thank you, Kyle, for joining us, and thank you, Trey. And we'll go now to Tony Rockamora of Don't Waste Your Hate. All right. Um, before I get into the show credentials, I just want to say about uh, the Trump situation, I, I am kind of happy uh, to see that some of the most ardent Trump supporters are now criticizing him for these past few weeks of um, just terrible decisions that, that have come out of the administration. So um, now I personally didn't vote for Trump, um, but really the reason I didn't vote for Trump um, is because in New Jersey, the Democrats win no matter what. We are a blue state, so there was no chance Trump was going to win here. So I threw my vote at the Libertarian Party, even though I find uh, Gary Johnson to be a uh, probably a nice guy, but just not a good messenger as far as the libertarian thing is concerned. But I don't begrudge people who decided they wanted to vote for Trump because maybe he would have been um, something better. But I think at this point it, it's, it's pretty clear, and maybe things will change, and I hope they do, but I think at this point it's clear that Trump is the same as everybody else. As Tom Woods says time and time again, no matter who you vote for, especially in these two major parties, uh, you end up with John McCain no matter what. You end up with someone who is spending a lot of money. You end up with someone who is continuing all these wars, continuing the, the, just the, the terrible um, imperial policies that the U.S. Uh, has been engaging in since World War II. So, uh, you know, that being said, to circle back to the Libertarian Party and now to give my credentials, we had two good episodes on Don't Waste Your Hate recently. Uh, the last one was Don't Waste Your Hate uh, 35, which uh, we discussed all the issues going on in the UK with free speech. I definitely suggest checking that out. It's pretty much a a good example of what most of our episodes are like, just kind of free-flowing conversation. It was a pretty long one. It went over an hour, but it was was worthwhile. It was a good combo. Um, And then the one before that, uh, for the Libertarian Party stuff, we spoke to Joshua Smith, who is running to uh, replace Nick Sarwark um, as the LNC chair. Now, I know most of us small L libertarians um, really have no interest in politics. Believe me, it was like a very big effort on my part to get myself to drive 30 minutes 
to go to the Libertarian State Convention in New Jersey yesterday. Believe me, I had no desire to do it, but I'm glad I did. Horton was there. I got to meet him. But um, if there's ever going to be a political solution to it, it's not going to be in the two parties. It's going to be in uh, a third party. And if a guy like Joshua Smith is able to um, take control, not take control, but if he's able to become the LNC chair of the Libertarian Party, I think at, it at least will give us something um, that we can look to to vote for while at the same time we continue the agorism, which is kind of just living liberty in a non-political way. But it'd be nice to be able to throw our votes toward a libertarian candidate that we can be proud of. So uh, that's don'twasterhate.com slash 34 uh, for that episode. Josh is a great guy. I suggest you listen to it. And uh, as far as Don't Waste Your Hate, we, um, I, we've been mentioning it for the past couple months, but we finally did get into the video thing. So we have video now, so you can check us out on YouTube or BitChute. We're, we're, uh, we're doing video as well as audio. And what's to come, I would say, is Jeff and I, um, as we, we continue to do our regular podcast, we're both also going to be doing little side projects. For me, I think I'm just going to do like a couple shorter videos a week, at least one per week. I don't know when that's going to start, but that is something I'm looking to do. And Jeff also is looking to do something similar on his own. All of it will be under the Don't Waste Your Hate umbrella and, of course, under the larger Libertarian Union umbrella. So uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Robert. Well, um, I'm Robert Johnson. I do the actual Anarchy podcast with my lifelong friend, Daniel Elwood. Um, We've recently broken off. And changed up the show a bit. We did. We used to have guests on and under the actual Anarchy banner, and where we, you know, analyze movies from a Rothbardian perspective. But lately, we've broken it up into now three different shows, which kind of maybe is a little bit confusing, maybe not. But uh, three different branded shows. Uh, one is the actual Anarchy podcast, which is the normal show, and then within that, we have the what do we call it? Last Nighters. That's right. Got the Last Nighters. Yeah, you're good at this. <laughs> I'm really, really freaking good at this. You call the Last Night. <laughs> call it the Last Nighters, which uh, is more of the normie friendly type of show, which is essentially just the meat of the episode where we talk about the movie. And then we have the the Boys Night Out, which is where we get on with a guest and we kind of discuss the previous episode or the episode or any kind of episode really that we've done in the past tell us we've done a good job bad job where we're wrong where we're right uh, and any uh, anything else where the conversation takes us um so yeah that's what we've been doing uh what are we going to do in the future here daniel well at this moment i think that we're going to still stay the course with the new changes and see if it gets us any more traction i do like the uh the concept that we have of of making the show more um, approachable and have more appeal by getting the anarchy stank off of the name, shortening the episodes, tightening up the format a little bit. We used to go an hour and a half to two hours sometimes, sometimes even longer. And now we're, we're targeting an hour, and the last nighter's version is even shorter. And it's a version that can be shared with listeners of the actual anarchy podcast who want to share it to uh, their friends and relatives who don't necessarily understand what anarchy is and, and don't want to have that stigma attached to it. But then we also have uh, the website, lastnighters.com, which m- people may stumble upon just for entertainment purposes and um, you know, movie analysis, etc. But they're going to get some libertarian and economic uh, information in those. Not so much in the last two episodes, Big Lebowski and um, Billy Madison, because there's not a whole lot in those. But they're, they're fun, and we go through a quote fest, and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. But um, let's wind down this State of the Libertarian Union talk show for March. I want to thank all of our participants, including uh, Patrick McFarlane from Liberty Weekly Podcast. You can find his work at libertyweekly.net. So thank you guys so much. We do these roundtable-type discussions once a month, uh, the last Sunday of each month. And so I do look forward to sharing future episodes with the audience and with you fine young gentlemen. Uh, It's been really excellent. Uh, I'm really proud of what we've been doing and being able to accomplish by joining our uh, efforts together in a collective commune style under the banner of Libertarian Union. And uh, you can find 
all the uh, individual shows that we have participating at libertarianunion.com. We have a Facebook page and then uh, about a dozen uh, individual shows that are all associated. So uh, audience, please do check that out. And I just want to say good night. I'll sign off and um, maximum freedom, everyone. Cheers. Peace.